Scott Farhard, Sandy Hagee Parker, Cornerstone Singers, thank you so much. This is the Christians United for Israel, and we're welcoming one of our regional directors from Region 10. He's pastor of the Bethel Christian Fellowship. Would you greet, please? Welcome, Ron Domina. Ron, would you come read the Word of God? Sam Bang, wherever you went, I invite you to be one of our speakers at the next great, greater Rochester, Nighttown or Israel. So see me afterwards. The word of the Lord to the prophet Isaiah concerning the Messiah to come and the Messiah that we follow. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Before I introduce Congressman Michelle Bachman, I've had something happen to me that has never happened to me in all of my life in the ministry. I have been in the ministry for 54 years, and I've just had one of the members of our audience tonight, Dr. Bob Shulman, and his precious wife, Mao, have made the commitment to match tonight's offering dollar for dollar to express their support of Christians United for Israel. <laughs> Dr. Bob, would you stand? Yeah. 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 
Dr. Bob said this is an expression of his appreciation to each of you for the demonstration of love for Israel and the Jewish people and the excellence of the Christian United for Israel presentation of our message to the world. Thank you, Dr. Bob and Mao. We appreciate it so very much. It is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker of the evening, Michelle Bachman is a Congresswoman best known for her candidacy for the 212 Republican presidential nomination. As a self-proclaimed constitutional conservative, Michelle Bachman is committed to fixing Washington's broken ways by advocating for America's adherence to the Constitution. In 2006, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman became the first Republican woman to be elected the representative of Minnesota in the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you, Minnesota. Michelle Bachman has become known on Capitol Hill as a member who champions tax reform, may God bless her, works to cut wasteful government spending and supports limiting the size of our government. She also is devoted to the repeal of Obamacare. A legislation she believes is an example of the government's recent uninhabited growth. Michelle Bachman's view that the government needs to make the kind of serious spending decisions that many families and small businesses across America have been forced to make. As a believer in the traditional values upon which this country was founded, she consistently defends America's religious liberties and the importance of the family as the first unit of government. She also has continuously worked to defend the right to life for all Americans, including the unborn. Michelle Bachman is a member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Financial Services Committee. She has taken the opportunity of serving on the Intelligence Committee to regularly advocate for peace through strength to ensure America's national security. As she, vo as she vowed in her oath of office, Michelle Bachman's continue to quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. She is devoted to doing her part to ensure America's safety. Michelle Bachman received her Doctor of Jurisprudence at the O.W. Coburn School of Law at Oral Roberts University and an LLM in Tax Law at the College of William and Mary. The Bachmans have been married over 30 years they have five children and have cared for 23 foster children, inspiring Botman's tireless efforts in Congress on behalf of America's foster and adopted children, a role that has earned her bipartisan praise. She is proud to represent Minnesota's sixth congressional district. Will you please put your hands together and make welcome our keynote speaker and great American, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. God of Israel be praised now and forever. It is an honor and a privilege for my husband Marcus and I to be here tonight, guests of Kufi, 
It wasn't that many years ago when I was first running for the United States Congress. I hopped a flight out of Minneapolis. I was on Delta. Seated next to me was a man who was so excited he couldn't stop talking. He told me he was on his way to Christians United for Israel in Washington, D.C. I was absolutely thrilled. I had always wanted to come and attend one of the conferences, and I asked him, is there any way that you think that I could possibly get in tonight? I'm sure it's sold out. Somehow he got me a phone number. Somehow I was able to get through. Somehow I was able to get in and had one of the most inspiring nights of my life. And now a little nobody from nowhere is standing before you fine people to address you on why Christians must stand with Israel. I know you will agree with me that it's absolutely important that we recognize and take the time to honor a man who takes no honor to himself. That would be Pastor John Hagee, his wife Diana, the board, and all who put together Christians United for Israel. Let's honor them tonight. Well, legend holds that on the sixth day, God turned and said to the angels, Today I am going to create a land called Israel with majestic mountains, beautiful lakes, lush forests, high cliffs overlooking sandy beaches with an abundance of sea life below, truly a place where milk and honey flow. And God continued to say to the angels, I shall make the land rich so as to make the inhabitants prosper. I shall call this land Israel. They shall be known as my chosen people. But Lord asked the angels, don't you think you are being too generous to these Israelites? Not really, God replied. Just wait and see the neighbors I'm about to give them. And that's what I'll be talking with you about tonight, the situation on the ground in Israel's very tough neighborhood and why we need to stand with Israel more than ever before. Because let me clearly state from the outset, this is not about saying that all Muslims are radical. We work with peaceful Muslims, but we cannot be ignorant of the very real objective reality that there is a radical wing of Islam that is dedicated to the annihilation of Israel and to the United States of America, and they are at work today. Consider Israel's neighbor, Egypt, a radical change in just the last few months. They are now completely under control of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood has a long history of threatening not only Israel, but the United States of America as well. And their effort to threaten jihad is legendary. In fact, I think their motto says it all. Allah is our objective. The Prophet is our leader. The Quran is our law. And jihad is our way. Dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. Two years ago, in fact, the Supreme Leader, Mohammed Badi, said, America is, quote, begin beginning to experience its end. It is heading toward its demise. America's demise is the goal of the Muslim Brotherhood. A few weeks ago, Badi used his weekly sermon to once again reconfirm his commitment to jihad against the State of Israel. Furthermore, since the fall of Mubarak and the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, Consider, the Israeli embassy in Egypt has been overrun. A strategic natural gas contract between Israel and Egypt has been canceled. Violence has escalated throughout the Sinai, now known as the Wild West, further putting pressure on Israel's southern border. And there's a real possibility that the 30-year peace treaty enjoyed between Israel and Egypt could end. Most recently, the newly elected Muslim Brotherhood President, Mohammed Morsi, said, Jerusalem, 
shall be Egypt's capital, God willing. Let's be perfectly clear. The undivided city of Jerusalem is not now, nor will it ever be, Egypt's capital. Because Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. What is even more troubling after all this is that our president has invited the Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi, to come to the United States for a visit. President Obama should insist that President Morsi repudiate the Muslim Brotherhood's calls for jihad against both Israel and the United States. And if he does not, then our president should refuse him entry to the United States. Along with President Obama's embrace of the newly elected Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood Parliament, our United States State Department just several weeks ago broke a federal law. Why would they do such a thing? Because they wanted to grant a visa to a member of a foreign designated terrorist organization. You heard me right. Not only to enter our country, as if that wouldn't be criminal enough, but also to attend a meeting inside the White House with the National Security Council. And what did this individual from a terrorist organization ask for when he was in the White House? He asked for the release of another terrorist, the Blind Sheik. The Blind Sheik is the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. This is reprehensible, and we need to have answers to the question, why would the State Department break a law two weeks ago to allow a terrorist to come into the White House and speak to the National Security Council? But if Egypt's turn to the Muslim Brotherhood wasn't bad enough, consider Israel's neighbor, Iran. While the Obama administration has been dawdling, Iran has become closer and closer to possessing a nuclear bomb and the means to deliver that nuclear bomb. And they continue to threaten the security of America and the very existence of the State of Israel. The simple fact is the administration has taken its eye off the most serious threat to Middle East security and that is a nuclear Iran. We must not countenance a nuclear Iran. How weak has our president been on the issue of Iran? In 2008, he said he would sit down with Iran without any further preconditions, and he did. When this failed, he warned Iran not to pursue their nuclear program. In fact, for three and a half years, he has warned Iran, do not pursue your nuclear program. And the president said again, now I mean it this time, if you don't stop your program, you know, I really mean it. I'm going to warn you again. Now please, Israel and the world are out of time. This is the moment for clarity in standing with Israel and against Iran, because Iran has been perfectly clear. Their top targets for elimination are Israel and the United States. We need to be perfectly clear to Iran. Two weeks ago, Iran bragged about another successful missile test. And on July 4th, when we were busy at picnics and parades, the commander of Iran's Air Force said that Iran had missiles aimed at 35 United States military bases as well as at Israel. This is tantamount by Iran as a declaration of war against our two nations, both the United States and Israel. 
And instead of siding with our friends in Israel, our president has repeatedly given the Iranian leaders the benefit of the doubt. But if the president thinks that Iran can be trusted, then we have to ask quite seriously, then who does he think is our enemy, if not Iran? In his Cairo speech in 2009, President Obama declared, Iran should have the right to access peaceful nuclear power. Pigs will fly before Iran seeks peaceful use of nuclear power. The president of Iran has told us unequivocally they intend to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And if the world has learned anything in the last 100 years, it should be this. When a madman threatens the annihilation of the Jewish people, listen, pay attention, and take heed. Another threat to Israel's security is Syria, and Iran has worked overtime in Syria. They have worked tirelessly to prop up the Assad regime in Syria. They continue to slaughter innocent men, women, children, now upwards of 14,000 innocents in Syria. Unfortunately, the opposition in Syria isn't much better. It's made up of violent elements of the Muslim Brotherhood and also Al-Qaeda. You see, Syria's leadership is a matter of picking your poison between the violent Assad regime or a terrorist opposition. And here's the bottom line. Both threaten Israel. But Egypt, Iran, and Syria aren't the only neighboring enemies of Israel that our nation has been coddling. America has willingly emboldened the Palestinians who are officially linked to the terrorist organization Hamas. And this is despite the fact that the Palestinian Authority refuses to even recognize Israel's right to exist, Israel's right to defend herself, and they still have failed to renounce Article 7 of the Hamas Charter, which calls for the killing of all Jews. If your neighbor announces that he intends to kill you, if your neighbor fires rockets at you, I think it's understandable that Israel would be just a wee bit nervous at the prospect of allowing millions of Palestinians into Israel under a suicidal right of return policy. Israel must be respected. And I say, until the Palestinian Authority renounces terrorism, couldn't we at least agree to stop sending them United States taxpayer money? And presuming the, the, presuming the Palestinians want peace, they could start by acting peacefully toward Israel. They could stop aiming rockets at innocent Jewish families and children in Starot. But Israel faces threats from all quarters. Look to Israel's east, to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, where Moses looked out and saw the Promised Land. But today, Jordan is under new pressure from elements of, you guessed it, the Muslim Brotherhood. They are seeking to bring down the Kingdom of Jordan, which would destabilize Israel's neighbor and bring even more hostile foes closer to Israel's border. To Israel's north is Lebanon. In the wake of the 2006 war, Lebanon fell under the influence of Hezbollah. That's the Iranian-dominated terrorist group, which has essentially taken over the, Le the Lebanese government. And even on Israel's Mediterranean coast, she hasn't been let alone. Who can forget the Turkish flotilla that was used to protest against the Israeli-imposed embargo against Gaza? And since that time, tensions have been dangerously rising between the two nations. But instead of recognizing the threat that radical extremism presents to Israel and the United States, our government, unfortunately, unbelievably, seems to be glossing over this here at home at the worst possible time for Israel. For example, an investigation was conducted by the United States Senate Homeland Security. They did it 
in the aftermath of the Fort Hood tragedy. Senator Lieberman and Senator Collins wrote, and I quote, the first thing the Defense Department must do now is explicitly identify the threat posed by violent Islamist extremism. Rather than cloaking it with vague terms, such as violent extremism or workplace violence. Then our military must train service members on the signs and stages of violent extremist radical radicalization so it can be reported and dealt with quickly and directly. From that, you would assume that our administration is tackling and teaching about radical Islam to those who are tasked with keeping us safe. The FBI, Homeland Security, the military, Department of Justice. But let me tell you what this administration is doing. After a letter was sent to the White House and signed by 50 Muslim organizations last October 19th, this administration embarked on a purge of our security agencies regarding the teaching of the ideology of radical Islam. In addition to not telling the truth about our enemies, we have also seen unprecedented intelligence leaks. These leaks include details of Israel's plans for developing, defending herself against Iran. Two examples come quickly to mind. In February of 2012, Defense Secretary Panetta stated he thought the Israelis could strike as early as April. In addition, in March 2012, it was leaked that the United States concluded that Israel was recently granted access to an air base in Azerbaijan on Iran's northern border. Unfortunately, these leaks and others like them sent two unmistakable messages across the world. The first message that was sent to the enemies of Israel was this. We, the United States, are fully prepared to disclose any action Israel might take militarily to defend herself against a nuclear Iran. The second message was undeniable to Israel. It was, if you take military action, you can be prepared to have the United States expose your plans. And where is the outrage over these unprecedented, never seen before in the history of the United States level of leaks, all that lead to Israel? We believe that Israel is the historic and biblical homeland of the Jewish people. We believe Israel is a vibrant democracy. We believe Israel is America's staunch ally. In fact, 11 minutes after Israel declared her independence, then-President Harry Truman announced the United States' unconditional support for the State of Israel. That was the most important action that we could take as a nation. We, the United States, were the undeniable military superpower of the world. And from that day, on May 14, 1948, the United States of America, without question, has had Israel's back. And every president since Democrat President Harry Truman, they have affirmed, without question, Republican, Democrat alike, that support of Israel. And that's why I pause to say we must realize that without being partisan, this is the first administration where our commitment to Israel has ever even been questioned. That cannot stand because Americans stand by Israel. Here is what I believe we must do today to stand by Israel. Number one, Israel is without a shadow, Jerusalem is without a shadow of a doubt, Israel's undivided capital. And therefore, since our government has failed to move our embassy to Jerusalem, do it. Do it today. Second, our president could recognize Israel's 1980 annexation of the Golan Heights and any settlements which Israel, as a sovereign state, chooses to annex. Simply put, Israel must be accorded the respect which any sovereign, democrat nation is entitled to. And lastly and most importantly, we must do everything we can to stand by and protect Israel, truly stand by Israel, 
We must never waver in that commitment, and the world must know that we will never waver in that commitment. We stand here together as biblical believers in God's promise to Abraham through Isaac in Genesis, and we believe that God blesses those who bless Israel. And our longing for the rebuilding of Israel was realized miraculously May 14, 1948, when Israel was literally reborn in a single day. The rebirth of Israel is a part of America's national heritage, too because our immediate and ongoing support of Israel is part of the reason that we have been so singularly blessed as a nation. As we read the book of, Mo of Numbers, therein God told Moses to send men to spy out the land of Canaan. He said, send a man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were to scope out intelligence, something that I like a lot. They were to scope out intelligence about the land, about the inhabitants of the land. Moses said, find out if the people are weak or if they're strong. Find out, Moses said, whether they live in camps or whether they live in strongholds. And find out what the fruit of the land is like. The men went into the land, and they found out that the land was extremely good. In fact, the grapes were so big, if you recall from the story, it took two men to carry a single cluster of grapes back to Moses because this land truly flowed with milk and honey. They hit the jackpot big time when they came back. But there was just one problem. The report that came back said that the people in the land were very big and they were very tall. They were intimidating, they were powerful, and they were deadly. And when the 12 returned to their camp, they showed Moses the good fruit that they found. But 10 of the men were quaking and shaking in their sandals, and they began to tell about the giants that they saw on the land and how fearful they were of the giants. They told of large cities with high, impenetrable walls around the cities. They were absolutely adamant. They said, without any reservations whatsoever to Moses, we cannot go into this land. They said, we look just like grasshoppers to them. In our own eyes, we were grasshoppers. And to these giants, we look like grasshoppers to them. In other words, they saw themselves as utterly and completely defeated before these giants. But that's not how God saw them. Did you hear me? That's not how God saw them. You see, how God saw them was through the eyes of victory. God saw through them faithfulness, and through faithfulness there would be victory, because God knew it wouldn't be them who would deliver the victory. It would be God who delivered the victory with his strong, powerful, right arm. But there were two men who had the courage to stand for Israel. Those two men were Joshua and Caleb. You know them well. They said they would possess the land of God that God had created for them. In fact, Caleb said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. We can do it. God said over and over to them, be strong and courageous, and again, be strong and courageous, and again, be strong and courageous, say it with me, be strong and courageous, and again, be strong and courageous, you see, it takes strength to be Jewish in Israel, in a tough neighborhood. It takes courage to stand and courage to remain amidst the onslaught of unannounced oncoming rockets. Israel, for my mind, has never been in greater peril than she is in today. Israel's survival has never been at greater stake than it is today. 
And no matter what actions this government or our president takes, we can know that those of us who count ourselves among Israel's most staunch allies and defenders must demonstrate the strength, the courage of Joshua, of Caleb, beloved friends of Israel. Be strong. Be courageous. Christians united for Israel, for Zion's sake, we will stand. God bless you. God bless Israel. God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Congressman Michelle Bachman. You have stirred our hearts. You've instructed us and you've challenged us well. At Christians United for Israel, we choose to honor God's name by making known his word. We continue to read his word, this time from the book of Psalms. I'm introducing from Southern California, the pastor of Father's House Church and director of our Region 14, Pastor Greg Stevens. Would you welcome him, please? Pastor Greg. Thank you, Michael. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge to the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them which seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings.
Thank you, Aaron Crabb. We're almost to the end, folks. Thank you for staying in this night to honor Israel. We're in Washington, D.C., and CUFI is active in Alaska. We call it Region 1. Pastor Gary Morton of the Anchorage Assembly of God Church comes now to read our closing scripture. Would you welcome Pastor Gary Morton? We rejoice in Psalm 125, verse 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people both now and forevermore. I'm honored to invite Pastor Alberto Delgado of Alpha and Omega Church and Florida Hispanic Outreach Director to bring the benediction. Praise the Lord. What a tremendous event. Give the Lord a hand for this. Hallelujah. Tremendous. Powerful. Cristianos Unidos por Israel. It sounds good, isn't it? How many here speak Spanish? Hey, well, I'm glad. I'm glad you do because that's who I'm going to be speaking up there, you know. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Uh, Known as a representative of Kufai. Hispanic director of the state of Florida, nor representation also of the Hispanic Pastors Association of Greater Miami that I am the president of. But, hallelujah, but as a, as a simple Cuban American, part of this great Hispanic, Spanish speaking people of this great country, I want you to know, I want to tell you that we are ready. We are ready to join efforts and we are ready to join our voices to yours to let the whole world know that we are screaming out of our lungs that Israel is not alone. Israel no está solo. Israel no está solo. It's not alone. I want to take this opportunity to say hello to our national uh, Hispanic director, Carlos Ortiz. Where are you, Carlos? He's there somewhere. He's a great man, great worker. He makes our job much easier in our state. So now let us pray. So let us stand. I, uh, they asked me to do the benediction. I ask the Lord, I pray that he will give me a prayer. <laughs> I ask the Lord, what do you want me to tell you? So he inspired me. Hey, don't worry about it, it's short. And, uh, <laughs> but join me in this as we go to the throne of grace. Father, we thank you for allowing us, allowing us to serve you during these difficult times. The perilous times that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy about they are already here. Lord, many things are happening and are taking place in our present society which are contrary to your heart. Israel continues to be persecuted and threatened by its neighbors. The level of danger is very high because of the hatred the devil has injected in the hearts of the people of Iran, which have the capacity of doing extreme evil and also the weak support that has been given to Israel from our present government here in the United States. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for allowing us to be in the front lines, taking a stand for what is right, for what is just, and for what pleases your heart. Christians United for Israel will continue not only to raise its voice, but aggressively make its presence count 
in support of the right of the Jewish nation to be and to keep the land that you gave them. The enemy desires to destroy Israel in order to come against us. You have placed Israel as a fence, as a wall of protection to the Christian world. Father, once more, we thank you for Kufi and the favor you have placed upon Pastor Hege and his wife and all the directors of this organization. Lord, we will continue to be committed to establish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Delgado. Thank you for coming to the night to honor Israel. Travel safely home. We have been asked to exit the building with exceptional speed. We've been asked to exit the building with special speed. Would you do so now? And we will see you next time. Thank you, and God bless you in your travels.